I guess that uh, that it's very interesting to think about the state of artificial intelligence research today, and especially in the context of many decades of cycles of, 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 of hype and disappointment. And, and of course, it's natural to ask ourselves whether we're in one of these sort of phases of, of, um, uh, of hype that's going to turn into another AI winter or whether there's something a little bit more going on here. Yeah, so then we think about um, what, what's generating all this hype at the moment. So, so, of course, it's machine learning, and in particular, it's machine learning um, in the context of neural networks. So it's applying neural networks uh, uh, to machine learning. And, um, and so I'm sort of nowadays working sort of in, in that area, in that space of, of neural networks and, and machine learning, but that's not really where my background is in, in artificial intelligence. So, so, um, so I uh, grew up in the tradition of good old fashioned AI, symbolic artificial intelligence. And so the people who were my mentors and, uh, and who I looked up to were indeed people like John McCarthy, who I knew very well, uh, and Bob Kowalski at Imperial College. And the tradition there was of symbolic artificial intelligence. So the vision was of making intelligence through cons by constructing uh, machines that acquired representations. And these representations were sort of language-like and had a logical-like structure and where what you uh, did with them was inference, so you reasoned uh, using these representations. And then, of course, um, uh, this, this whole approach was then very much critiqued by people like Rod Rodney Brooks, and um, uh, who started to emphasize the whole issue of embodiment and whole agent architectures, and, and felt that that approach was, uh, was sort of, uh, the, the representations were coming out of the heads of the engineers and weren't grounded in uh, an agent that interacted with the real world and acquired data through that means. Um, and I felt very much at the time in the sort of early 90s that this, that Brooks had a point. So I sort of moved sideways somewhat and started working more in, got, got more interested in neuroscience and threw away all of the kind of reputation I built in symbolic AI, started getting interested in neuroscience and building uh, computer models of the brain and, and neural dynamics and so on. Um, and now, but now, what's happened is there's been this resurgence of interest in in neural networks because, thanks to the availability of of large amounts of computing power and, in particular, large amounts of data, and of course you need the computing power to process the data, then some of those techniques that previously were only modestly successful, like back propagation, turn out to be really, you know, really work really well on certain applications. So now we're in a position where we've got this resurgence of interest in AI, there's a huge amount of commercial interest, so we've got this hype, uh, peak of hype again, and people are starting to talk about the big vision of artificial general intelligence, as people often call it now, and human level AI, and you know, and people are starting to think again, well, are we gonna get there? And so my uh, angle on that uh, is, is that, well, when you look at um, the current generation of deep learning approaches, then there certainly are a number of shortcomings, and and when I first started getting, getting into AI again, I, I, um, I got DeepMind's DQN system, their Atari playing system, up and running in the lab in Imperial. And um, I was watching it playing. And, and, and of course, it does, it's an absolutely amazing piece of software because it can learn any of these games out of the box from scratch and get to a human level or superhuman level in many of them. Um, uh, so it's an amazing piece of software, but when you watch it learning to play Space Invaders, you're struck by how very, very slow it is at learning. And, um, and, you, and it was really sort of sitting in front of the screen, watching this thing grindingly, slowly flickering around the little, you know, um, uh, gunship at the bottom of the Space Invaders screen. It's flickering around for hours and hours, being utterly useless, and eventually, eventually it gets better and better, and of course it eventually gets really, really, really good at this. But it's really slow, and, it, and, the, and what strikes you is that, it, of course, it doesn't, the computer hasn't really got any real understanding of what's going on in the game. It doesn't have um, the kind of understanding that we, that we have when we play one of these games, where we think of this game in terms of objects and movements and, uh, and little rules about what happens when, you know, what follows what and what events happen and so on. Uh, so this got me to thinking about you know, my, my uh, dark past in symbolic artificial intelligence. And um, 
it got me to thinking how important <coughs> many of those principles were that people like John McCarthy had drummed into into our heads, you know, back in the day. So, uh, so th things like the idea that these sorts of language-like representations, propositional representations, have a compositional structure. So, so uh, you can break them down into parts that represent different aspects of the scene, and uh, and they can be recombined in many different ways. And you've got reusable units of knowledge, and that's what you need to be able to build up a kind of actual uh, understanding of the world around us. And the current generation of deep learning systems, or at least in, at that point, was nowhere near being able to do that sort of thing. So, so I got very interested in how you could rehabilitate some of these ideas from good old-fashioned symbolic AI in a contemporary neural network context. And that's, that's the kind of thing that I've been, been interested in. Um, how can we build artificial intelligence and hopefully move towards increasingly sophisticated uh, AI by combining elements of classical symbolic AI and and neural network deep learning. So those are the kinds of that's one kind of technical question I'm very interested in. Then uh, then there are philosophical questions that have exercised me since you know uh, uh, well since I was a, a child really. Well actually these technical questions have sort of exercised me since I was a teenager as well, although I didn't have the means to really address them properly. Uh, but the philosophical questions uh, all uh, concern, well, uh, philosophy of mind questions. So I'm particularly interested in consciousness. So, I, so, I'm, so I'm extremely interested in, in um, philosophical questions, particularly about consciousness. Um, and now I have to preface what I'm about to say with, uh, with something very important, which is I don't think anybody is about to create human-level artificial intelligence or anything where the question of consciousness is applicable to AI yet. I think we're a long way from being able to do that. But, of course, philosophy speculates about what's possible in principle, and I'm really deeply interested in, in the question of um, could we make, could we ever build AI that had consciousness, and what would it be like? And indeed, what is, so Aaron Sloman, the, the British philosopher, uh, has this great phrase, the space of possible minds. And the idea is that the space of possible minds encompasses not only the biological minds that have, that have arisen on this earth, but also you know, extraterrestrial intelligence and whatever forms of biological or evolved intelligence are possible but have never actually occurred. And of course, artificial intelligence and the whole range of possible ways we might build AI. Um, so so I, I love this idea that of the space of possible minds and trying to understand it, the structure of the space of possible minds in some kind of principled way. And then a qu really deep question arises of how is consciousness distributed through this space of possible minds? Um, is something that has a sufficiently high level of intelligence necessarily conscious? Conscious Is consciousness a prerequisite for human level intelligence or for general intelligence? I mean, I tend to think the answer to that is kind of no. But I think it needs to be fleshed out a little bit because I think we need to break down the concept of consciousness into, into different aspects, some of which can, uh, we, all of which tend to occur together in, in humans, but which um, occur, can occur independently or not, you know, some subset of these can occur on its own in a artificial intelligence. So maybe we can build an AI that clearly has an awareness and understanding of the world. So we very much want to say, oh, it's, it's, it's conscious of its surroundings, and yet doesn't experience any emotion, is not capable for, of suffering. So, so we can imagine building, I think, something that has some aspects of consciousness and lacks others. Um, and then, but then I'm very interested in some of these deep questions like the, uh, the so Chalmers so-called hard problem of consciousness. You know, how is it that, how is it that it's possible for experience, something that, that has experience, to arise out of pure matter at all. You know, classical questions in, in the mind-body problem, essentially, in a slightly contemporary guise. And then how does that question um, uh, arise in the context of, uh, uh, play out in the context of artificial intelligence? So, so and, and I have a very Wittgensteinian outlook on this, and, I, I, and, and I'm, I'm interested in the, idea that maybe, uh, I, I think that, that intuitively we feel that there always has to be an answer to this 
question of here's this artifact, this creature, this thing. Is it like something to be that thing or not? Is it conscious or not? And intuitively we feel that there must be a yes-no answer to that. It's not just something that we, that we decide. Like if we're looking at a painting and, and you say, well, is it beautiful or not? Then, then somebody can say, well, it's all beauty in the eye of the beholder. It's all relative. It depends on your culture or your, where you're coming from, your taste and so on. So it's, it's you know, we decide. The, 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 one person can decide one way, another person can decide another way. Consciousness, though, whether, it's, whether or not it's like something to be something, it doesn't seem to be in that kind of space. It seems to be the kind of thing that there must be a fact of the matter. Either it is capable of suffering or it's not. And a, a Wittgensteinian kind of perspective challenges that and tries to make us rethink the very idea of, of consciousness and rethink it in terms of the way we use lang consciousness language and sort of undermines the idea that, that there has to be a fact of the matter. Yeah, I mean, I think Rod Brooks's uh, views back in the 19, late 80s and early 90s when he, when he launched this critique of the current state of this, or the current methodology in artificial intelligence, I think many, many of his points, the points that he made then, are now very much mainstream and orthodox. Um, you know, the idea that we need to deal with, with whole agents interacting with complex environments, I think is... Uh, you know, if we ever want to build sophisticated AI, I think that's become more or less uh, an orthodoxy, really. Mm -hmm. So um, now there are other aspects of his critique that I think are much less accepted. And he had the, the sort of more radical end of it was was he rejected the idea of representations altogether, and and even um, uh, so, so 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 your two schools of AI at the time and the the, the, the symbolic approach, which obviously had representation at the heart of it and the neural network approach had representations as an important w part of the way that they were thinking as well but it was a very different kind of representation distributed representation and so on but both those schools of thinking thought that representation was important and today with the, the with neural networks being so, so important people still people now in the neural networks community talk about representations all the time and don't feel embarrassed by that so that aspect of brooks's critique i think has you know, has is no longer uh, um, very. You know, is no longer really uh, very potent in, uh, today. And I think he himself would would backtrack away from that a bit. Yes. So 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 I, I had an interesting. Um, I, so I, I had the the uh, privilege of meeting of having breakfast with Daniel Kahneman at a, at, a, at a conference actually, where where we were the first two to turn up for breakfast, and so I, we sat down together. And I um, had a chance to chat with him Doesn't in his um, uh, in his work, where he talks about this, you know, two systems, the sort of system one and system two. So he doesn't talk about consciousness there. He he perhaps is still, you know, of, is still prefers to avoid this philosophically difficult concept, which is there's a lot of wisdom in avoiding, <laughs> avoiding that that term and that. Um, but, uh, but well, you see, I had this conversation with him comparing his ideas with Bernie Barr's ideas. So, so, so I, I have this you know, long-standing interest in, in, in consciousness, and I got particularly interested in Bernie Barr's ideas about global workspace theory. So Bernie Barr's has, that's, that, that's you know, one, of the, um, uh, one of the kind of leading contenders for, a, for the basis of a scientific theory of consciousness is global workspace theory. Um, and, um, and in global workspace theory, you have this clear division between conscious processing and unconscious processing. And the idea is that conscious processing is mediated by this global workspace, which, uh, uh, which uh, uh, as it were, activates the whole brain, if we're talking in a, in a neural context. So a con the idea is that when you consciously perceive something, then the the the, the influence of that stimulus that you're perceiving pervades the whole brain but via the global workspace, via some kind of broadcast mechanism. So that's the, the sort of essence of it. Whereas, whereas if, you're uncon if, you're, if, you're, if there's unconscious processing of the stimulus by the brain, then, uh, then, then it's just localized processing. And, and then, you can, then you can sort of draw up a little table of the properties of your of conscious processing versus unconscious processing. And there are things like conscious processing is slow, uh, you know, flexible, 
um, uh, uh, and, and so on. Whereas unconscious processing is fast and uh, and and but stereotypical and and so on. And this this little collection of properties matches very closely with System One and System Two in in Daniel Kahneman's um, work. So I, so I said to him, "Oh, you know, th th these seem like very similar ideas." And he just he just assented immediately. He said, "Yes, they're very close." Ideas, to, and, and you know, and he he obviously knew about Bernie Barnes's work, and didn't really have a problem with 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 matching those two theories. I, so, so I'm a big fan of of Dan Dennett's uh, uh, thinking, and probably of all the philosophers around today who are working on consciousness, his views are, are closest to mine. I'd say so. He's also very influenced by Wittgenstein. Um, so so he's not a fan of the hard, hard problem, problem, easy problem distinction, and neither am I. And, uh, and, it, and it very much comes back to Wittgenstein again and, um, uh, and the idea that this hard problem, easy problem distinction is a sort of artifact of our language. It's a sort of manufactured, um, uh, manufactured philosophical problem that isn't really real if you, if, you, if you think about the things that are actually in front of us, which are human beings behaving in complex ways. Mm -hmm. Um, and it's only when we sit down and start to, you know, use language in a peculiar way that we start to think that there's some kind of issue here and there's some kind of metaphysical division between inner and outer, between subjective and objective and, uh, uh, and uh, hard problem, easy problem. Um, but, but, but it's a very, very difficult territory, I, I think, and, it's, uh, and just, just a few kind of trite sentences like that don't, don't really don't really help very much. <laughs> it, when we're building artificial intelligence it's natural to ask what, what is intelligence and if we want to think about human level artificial intelligence then what do we mean by intelligence? And there's this phrase artificial general intelligence, AGI, that's, that's current and that wasn't current you know, 20 years ago and I think that's that little word general is the, is the critical thing. Um, and generality is key, I think, to, to, to real intelligence. And so, so I, I'm, I'm happy to say that, uh, to, to venture a definition of intelligence, which is uh, intelligence is the ability to uh, solve problems and attain goals in a wide variety of environments. And the key there is the variety of environments. So uh, if you have an, an agent that is able to deal with with a completely novel, unseen type of environment and, uh, and adapt itself to be able to deal with that, then that's that is a, a sign of intelligence, and you can and you can almost quantify this mathematically. Um, and indeed, this is this is very much Shane Legg's uh, kind of definition of intelligence. Yes. So what I mean by an agent is um, uh, is a is uh, a computer program or a, a robot. So it could be an embodied computer program, or it, it might not be embodied, but it has to interact with uh, an environment. So there has to be uh, sensory input, and there has to be, as it were, action or motor output. And the, so, so the agent is the bit in the middle that's deciding how to act on the basis of what it perceives. So I've been sort of obsessed with AI really since, <laughs> since I was a teenager, and it was the iRobot stories by Isaac Asimov that got me into, the whole, into this whole area. Um, and that's what led me to study computer science at high school, so at A-levels, as we uh, uh, call them in the UK, and that, that, was in, that would have been in the early 80s, so um, uh, actually late 70s and early 80s. Uh, then I went to Imperial College London, and that's where I did my degree in, in computer science. Um, and uh, so one of the most prominent people I studied with there was, was Bob Kowalski. So Bob Kowalski was really the the, uh, the founding father of logic programming and very much came from the whole um, Stanford sort of tradition of, uh, of logic-based artificial intelligence that was founded by, you know, in turn by John McCarthy. Um, so that was the sort of tradition that of, of, of artificial intelligence teaching that went on at Imperial College. And then I went on to do my, uh, my PhD at Cambridge, King's College, Cambridge. I was at King's College, uh, but did my PhD in the computer laboratory there. Uh, with uh, Bill Kloxin, who, who wrote a, um, a well-known textbook on, on Prolog, um, on Prolog programming language. So it was all logic programming, and uh, logic programming applied to artificial intelligence kinds of problems. And then when I, as a postdoc, so as a postdoc I went back to Imperial College and worked with Bob Kowalski, and I was very interested in uh, how you use logic to formalize common sense uh, aspects of common sense, how to represent 
actions and events and space and, and things like that uh, in, in using logical formalisms. Um, and I worked in that area for, for uh, you know, many years as a postdoc um, and then uh, before I got a faculty position at, uh, at Imperial College uh, again. Um, and was still working in that, in, uh, in that sort of tradition for a little while, um, but, but then gradually became a bit disillusioned with where the logic-based approach was, was going. Um, and uh, that's when I sort of started to move sideways a little bit. And at that point I was in the Department of Electrical Engineering at Imperial College. And one of the people who was, uh, one of the prominent people there was Igor Alexander. Uh, so, and I, so Igor Alexander also was uh, at a stage in his career sufficiently senior where you could start thinking about things that were at that time really not allowed, you know, not allowable as, as academic disciplines like consciousness as academic topics. Um, uh, so, so I spent a lot of time talking to Igor both about neural networks, about how the brain worked and, and about consciousness. And I started to shift my interests at that point and, and uh, you know, threw away all of the reputation I built up in this kind of logic-based knowledge rep representation stuff. If I had had any sense, I would have just ploughed that furrow for the rest of my career. Um, but, uh, but I got interested in the brain and then started building neural network models that embodied various ideas. Um, uh, so I started building spiking network models that, uh, that, that to, to illustrate certain uh, um, uh, dynamical phenomena which I thought were important in, 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 uh, for, for intelligence and things like yeah, that. Yeah, so I mean, I think it's really, really important to, to, to have, um, that, to, to, to not forget the history you know, here because there's, there's all kinds of hidden treasure, well, all kinds of buried treasure, yeah. and uh, not knowing the history is, is, is bad. So, so, so for instance, I, I've recently um, got interested in some of, uh, or, or, or some of Roger Shank's ideas. So scripts, um, which you know, this, this, this idea of of, uh, of of a script, like the, you know, he used to talk about the restaurant script, was his classic ex example, and and Minsky frames, you know, some of those concepts that um, that they themselves got got subsumed by the logic-based approach to knowledge representation in a way, because people started to say, well, there's all this mess of different different pseudo formalisms and uh, we need to have a more theoretical approach and, and, and if you look into it then semantic nets and frames and scripts they're all can all be subsumed by logic so we ought to t start with logic and but there's all kinds of you know buried treasure in the thinking that those people did and the, and the thinking that John McCarthy did about all this sort of stuff and Pat Hayes Pat Hayes' Naive Physics Manifesto, I don't know if you know that, that. So that is just one of the classic papers of artificial intelligence. Mm -hmm. So Pat Hayes, of course, w wrote this famous paper with John McCarthy, McCarthy and Hayes, um, which was uh, some philosophical problems from the standpoint of artificial intelligence, a 1969 paper. But, but, but then in the early 80s, uh, Pat Hayes had this... Um, uh, uh, had this paper called the Naive Physics Manifesto, where he set out uh, a, a research agenda which was all about trying to formalize the fundamental concepts of common sense, like things like liquids and pouring and containers and, and you know, simple and space and time and things like that. Uh, that. And, uh, and that was just such a classic paper. And maybe the logic-based approach to that wasn't the right one, but much, but, but still many of his insights can be kind of translated into, into terms that are relevant today. So uh, I think it's really, really important to know, uh, you know, to know your sort of history of, 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 of the field. So it's interesting that those cyber, cybernet, cybernetis, cyberneticians, cyberneticists, so those early cyberneticists um, like Norbert Wiener, um, uh, uh, there was there were, there were all these British counterparts. So people like, there was Ross Ashby and, and, and um, yes. And Gordon Pask, yes, who, who I heard actually give a lecture at Imperial College when I was an under, undergraduate, which was utterly baffling. <laughs> but, uh, but there was this, uh, there was this sort of, um, uh, all these British cy cyberneticists. And I don't know if you know about the Ratio Club. So the Ratio Club was this um, sort of, you know, uh, sort of intellectual club that met in London in, would have been in the 50s. Uh, where where uh, Alan Turing and Jack Good and all these these sort of people who came from Bletchley and were thinking about artificial intelligence soon after that uh, were then were were in the same room as people like Ro Ross Ashby and so they, they it was all much more mixed in together in those days and the and they became sort of you know the cybernetics sort of 
s disappeared um, uh, and, and the whole digital approach to computing kind of came to the fore a little bit after that. So when these guys were all first talking about these ideas, it was all much more of a, like von Neumann would have been talking about, you know, in one breath about, you know, digital type architectures, the, the nascence of them, and in another breath would have been talking about um, feedback loops. And, the, the, you know, it was all part and parcel of a large intellectual pool of ideas at the time. Yeah. Well, of course, Rod Brooks, who we've mentioned a couple of times, so Rod Brooks brought some of those ideas back in back into fashion a bit because, um, uh, he, you know, he was very interested in feedback loops and, uh, uh, and, and the, you know, in general, the feedback loop that with, the, with the environment where you have, have sen low-level sensors and then you have some kind of simple processing and then you have your motor output and you can dev devise very simple feedback loops that can give rise to very complex emergent behavior, the kind of thing that William Gray Walter, oh yeah, talking about the ratio problem. So, so William Gray Walter, of course, is one of the, 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 the famous British cyberneticists who devised you know, these very, very early robots, like the, these little tortoises, one of which is still exhibited in the Science, science Museum. Um, uh, so, so Rod Brooks you know, w was rehabilitated m many of those sorts of ideas um, in the, in, in, in the uh, early 90s. Uh, which were then, you know, taken on board a little bit by this whole artificial life uh, movement. So then there's this artificial life movement grew up and they, they were thinking about those kinds of ideas as well. And Stop, I'll tell you who I did know very well is John McCarthy. So, so John McCarthy, um, uh, so I think I first met him in 1988, around, around about then. Uh, and, uh, you know, we were going to all the same kind of uh, little workshops about uh, logic-based AI, basically, and and common sense reasoning, and, and, and so on, and I uh, and I'm you know I started meeting him at all these different places around the world as you do as you do, and I I kind of got to know him quite well, and uh, and in fact he invited me to Stanford um, uh, at the, at his expense or at the expense of one of his grants, and I had a couple of visits to Stanford which lasted a few weeks uh, where I was John's John's uh, guest. Um, and, uh, and, you know, so I knew him really pretty well. He even came to my house and, uh, and, and things like that, in, you know, in the UK. Um, and, and certainly he had a, he had a big, has had a big influence on me I, as, a, as a, a, a role model of, a, of somebody who thinks outside the box. I think what people don't really uh, appreciate is that, is, that, is that the kinds of ideas that John had were really like crazy at the time <laughs> and so 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 it, 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 later in his career it was very easy to see john as a kind of like a very as, as representing the conservative end of ai but you have to remember that when he first put these ideas out there like he he, he would have seen like the the crazy person and uh, so so he, so I, i've always felt that by by abandoning John's kind of AI, which I did, I was being more John-like <laughs> than the people who, who rigorously kind of followed his style of AI, because, because you know, in a, in a sense, that's what I think he would have. He that that's the spirit of John McCarthy is to kind of think outside the box, and whenever you you know, if you knew him well and and you spoke to him a, a lot. Um, he was he would always come up with like the crazy example that would just shoot down your whole theory and it, that you would never have thought of you know some crazy example of human behavior or th or cognition or thinking or something and, you, and 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 you know it really got you into this habit of of like thinking of the of the of the out of the box examples and counter examples and ways of thinking and I, and so so to my mind he was a john was a great inspiration uh, for me